everyone. I am Leslie Cordero, a Senior Disaster Risk Management Specialist at the World Bank. On behalf of the Resilient Cities Network and the World Bank, we would like to welcome all of you to this 13th installment of the Cities on the Frontline Speaker Series, Cities on the Road to COP27. The Cities on the Frontline is a virtual thought leadership speaker series, which began in 2020, co-organized by the Resilient Cities Network and the World Bank Group's City Resilience Program. This provides city practitioners, the industries, and the residents that they support an understanding and means of responding to the pandemic and its associated stresses. It also provides solutions for planning towards a more resilient recovery. And in a span of two years, we are proud to have over 6,000 participants from around the world who have attended the sessions. A significant portion of the attendees are from city governments who shared tangible stories, real challenges, and on the ground experiences. Nadine Barbar of the Resilient Cities Network and I will be co hosting this session. But before we start, let me remind everyone of the intention of the speaker series and the ground rules of our conversation today. The purpose of this global seminars is to have an open and honest learning conversation. The calls are not on the record, and we ask you not to attribute any comments unless you have the person's express permission to do so. We can help you obtain this permission if needed. Tonight, we have more than 350 registered participants for the call today. So to facilitate the discussion, may we ask you to write your questions on the Q&A function of the WebEx. Please note that the recording of this session and the PowerPoint presentations will be posted online next week. So let's get the ball rolling. Nadine, over to you. Leslie, and welcome everyone to another session of Cities on the Frontline series. We are very welcome for all of you who uh, have joined us today and uh, on this very special panel talking about Cities on the Road to COP27. We're only nine days separating us from COP and the Resilient Cities Network and the World Bank have decided to dedicate this space today to talk about what are the practices and the plans and what are the messages uh, the representative today on our panel are bringing to COP. We will be listening from them and uh, it will be an opportunity to merge virtually before we go to COP. And uh, I will introduce briefly our panelists today, our very special panelists to you, and then we can go into uh, their presentation in a bit. I'm very happy to present uh, Dania Petrik, who is a professional uh, officer uh, in climate change, energy and resilience at ECLI. Um, Dania is not only a climate and development specialist, but she's also a researcher and a communication officer. Her research focuses on uh, trans, uh, transversal climate uh, risks and where she tries to establish the entry points to mainstreaming climate priorities into development plans. And recently, she's also been seconded uh, through uh, ECLI Africa to lead on the city's uh, Race to Resilience initiative as the engagement manager to, to their campaign. We're very happy to have you, Daniel, with us. Thank you for being here. Uh, today, Pablo also, will, uh, Mariani will be uh, sharing uh, from the UCLG World uh, Secretariat. He is a policy officer uh, for sustainable urban uh, uh, policy uh, focused on uh, decentralized cooperation and local level advocacy. Um, under the framework of UCLG World Secretariat, uh, Pablo has many roles uh, uh, as a focal point for uh, UCLG, uh, supporting their Race uh, to Zero campaign and Race to Resilience campaign. And he is also uh, acting as uh, the co-chair for the Global Regional Coordination Technical Work Group for the Global Convenant of Mayors. Welcome, Pablo. It's a pleasure to have you as well. And from Resilient uh, uh, Cities Network side, we have Dana Omran, uh, Global Director for Strategy and Operation, and our Regional Director for Africa. Uh, Dana comes with uh, many years of experience working also for uh, the, World Bank, the World Bank before and the International Finance Cooperation, focused on financial and private sector development. And she has worked uh, on advising several startups in her career and worked on presidential campaigns in her nat native land, Egypt. 
Very happy to see you here, Dan, as well, and looking forward to your presentations, all of you. So I would go first to you, Dania. Uh, if you can please share with us what is the, uh, the message that ECLI is bringing to COP this year? What are your agendas? And how can also participants today get engaged with your plans and know more about this? Please go. Thank you very much, Nadine. And thanks so much for having me here today. It's fantastic um, to be able to present to you. So um, just to give a bit of context, I'll just open with a little bit about ICLI. So ICLI, Local Governments for Sustainability, is a global network of more than 2,500 local and regional governments committed to sustainable urban development. Across the world, we're active in more than 125 countries, and ICLI has been working with and advocating for local and subnational governments in the global arena for over 30 years. At ICLI Africa, we work across the various development agendas, aligning with both African and international policies, and we understand and work closely within the realities of our continent. Um, in total, we work with more than 450 cities and regions to drive local action. So we've been working with African cities and regions, large and small, remote or well-connected, no matter where they are on their sustainability journey for over two decades. And we offer a variety of solutions through programs and projects, networks, platforms, tools, and services. Um, next slide, please. So as we all know, climate change will undoubtedly um, present one of the most significant risks to global development objectives over the next decade. And we've already seen some of the impacts um, that affect both the global north and the global south. So how ICLI works is we support local and subnational leaders to find locally relevant sustainable solutions to the complex interrelated challenges that climate change presents. Um, and recognizing that cities are actors, first responders, and representatives of the governments closest to our urban communities. So at the subnational level, ICLI drives change along five interconnected pathways that cut across sectors and jurisdictional boundaries. These pathways are low emission development, nature-based solutions, equitable and people-centered development, resilient, and circular development pathways. So working across these five pathways helps enable our local and regional governments to develop solutions to the climate change crisis in a holistic and integrated way so that we're able to change, create change across entire urban systems, regardless of sector. Next slide. So I think we all understand the context of cities being on the front line. We know that it is essential to address the challenges and solutions related to the triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution and waste in a synergistic way, especially if we're aiming to ensure a sustainable urban future in our cities. So cities and regions act as first responders to the climate emergency, and their role in fighting the climate crisis is pivotal to achieving international climate targets. Since um, the Earth Summit in 1992, nine stake, when nine stakeholder groups, including local authorities, were designated as essential partners in implementing the global sustainability agenda, the local governments and municipal authorities, or LGMA constituency, has represented networks of local and regional governments under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. ICLI acts as the designated focal point of the LGMA constituency. So in this way, we have served as the voice of cities and regions since the very first Conference of the Parties, or COP, in 1995, and we've continued to achieve advocacy success for multi-level action in the climate, nature, and desert desertification processes. <laughs> Sorry, quite a mouthful there. Um, the annual conference of the parties is the highest decision-making forum for UNFCCC implementation. And um, every year, the UN regional groups appoint a national government as the COP presidency 
um, they nominate the high level climate action champion and they set the themes for action and negotiation based on their national and regional priorities. The LGMA itself seeks to engage with and support these COP presidencies in order to inform and drive progress on special networks and initiatives that the presidencies may designate independent from the UNFCCC. So in this way, the LGMA works on behalf of the Global Task Force the task force of local and regional governments, which is a joint global policy and, advoc and advocacy initiative of the major international networks of local governments in the area of climate specifically. So, in that sense, the entire year messages are being developed that will be taken forward at COP through this task force. Um, next slide. Please. So, why do cities need to act? Um, I've just put some quick stats here. It, cities are home to 55% of the global population, and this is set to grow. Um, and um, without going into too much detail, I think we we know that cities are going to feel the impacts of climate change first and foremost, and have to act. And some of our cities across the globe are extremely undercapacitated and under resourced. Um, next slide, please. So, as uh, along with our work as the LGMA focal point, um, ICLE has had a very active climate program since 1991, supporting local and regional governments to tackle climate change. And it's for this reason that we have thrown our full weight behind both the global race to zero and race to resilience campaigns and why two of our um, staff members, including myself, are working directly with the UNFCCC high-level climate champions um, and race to resilience campaign within the resilience team. And here I myself lead on engagement with the city's race to resilience, as Nadine already mentioned. So for those that haven't heard of it, the city's race to resilience focuses on driving cities to join and pledge their commitment to the global fight against climate change via the global race to resilience campaign run by the UNFCCC high level climate champions. So the race to resilience as a global campaign aims to rally leadership and support from cities, regions, businesses and investors to help frontline communities build resilience and adapt to the impacts of climate change with the overarching goal to build the resilience of 4 billion people by 2030. Launched in July of last year, Cities Race to Resilience is an initiative under, underneath the global overarching campaign, and it's the primary initiative for cities themselves to join the global Race to Resilience campaign. Um, it presents cities the unique opportunity to showcase action and drive ambition according to their own contextually relevant local landscape and offers them the opportunity to be showcased at the COP and recognized for their actions. What is so fantastic about the city's race to resilience is that it is a, a group of um, networks and partners that have come together, including C40 Cities, CDP, GCOM, ICLE, Resilient Cities Network, UCLG, WWF, and the World Resource Institute to mobilize this unprecedented coalition of cities. Um, by signing up, cities show that they are committed to prioritizing resilience and impl implementing inclusive and resilient climate action ahead of and beyond the COPs. Um, and I'll drop the, the URL into the chat um, as soon as my presentation is done, where cities can actually sign up directly to join the, the initiative. So cities are eligible to join this initiative by pledging to integrate climate change, adaptation and resilience across aspects of urban planning. Um, and this takes the form, well, this, this is according to their own local context, whatever they can do, they can commit to doing, whether that's one action or 64 actions across 11 thematic areas. Um, and these areas include buildings, food systems, water, nature-based solutions, community, community engagement, et cetera. Um, as, a, as the initiative lead, our objective is to have 200 cities committed by COP27, 
and we currently have over 60 signatory cities, as well as Maharashtra state from India, which itself covers 48 cities. Um, this year was the first year that cities that have signed up to the city's race to resilience could report on their selected um, online reporting platform. And um, we have just received analysis from the CDP ICLEI track where of our um, cities race to resilience signatories, 80% reported on their climate actions and they've reported on over 224 adaptation goals and over 190 climate related projects, which they hope to attract financing. Nearly half of these are related to energy transport or buildings, um, and the vast majority are early stage projects. Um, in other words, they're scoping or feasibility projects. So what is happening for COP across ICLEI as the LGMA focal point and cities race to resilience, as well as um, ICLEI Africa specifically? Next slide, please. So, as Sharm El Sheikh prepares for the implementation COP, the LGMA constituency is getting ready to host the multi level action pavilion. It's an online and in person pavilion in the COP27 blue zone where national discussions and decisions will be made locally relevant under the motto multi level action delivers. Um, the multi level action Pavilion will provide a home in the blue zone for local and regional governments throughout the two weeks of COP through over 70 sessions and organized by more than 25 partners. In addition, the Urban Africa in Action at COP will be convened by ICLEI Africa and partners, and this is a platform for African urban leaders to influence the global response to the climate emergency. Um, the outcomes from the Urban Africa in Action sessions will feed into COP27 outcomes and messaging and call attention to the realities faced by African cities and their unique needs. Finally, on Cities Race to Resilience, we have been hard at integrating outcomes related to our committed cities and their climate actions across the Marrakesh partnership themes of resilience, water, oceans and coasts, human settlements, as well as the cross-cutting themes of finance and planning. In fact, Cities Race to Resilience are leading on the Marrakesh Partnership Implementation Lab on actionable adaptation plans that will be held on the 17th of November in the Action Zone, where we are aiming to showcase case studies of the exemplary climate action plans from cities, states, and regions that are signatories to the Race to Resilience. The session will focus on the Global South with high-level representation from Africa, Asia, and South America and we'll unpack their recurring needs that support actionable adaptation plans at the local level. In other words, we're looking at an in-depth, um, or we're taking an in-depth look at not only the challenges faced in building evidence-based adaptation plans, but how to take these from planning to implementation. Um, and with that, I end my presentation, but just to make a note that um, we've recently launched an online learning platform, which is a resource for climate change researchers practitioners and policymakers, um, and includes different toolkits across different sectors and um, themes, including embedded generation, multi-level governance, managing ecosystem services, and smart homes, amongst others. So again, I'll drop the, the URL in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vivian. It's very interesting to hear what ICLEI is uh, planning to do, uh, the race to resilience, uh, encouraging cities to participate and visit your pavilion. I'm sure everybody will have uh, an interest and they would have questions later. Thank you. So to share what uh, UCLG is planning to do in COP and how they're encouraging cities also to participate in how local governments are taking the lead in this initiative, let's all welcome the policy officer of UCLG, Pablo Mariani. Over to you, Pablo. Thank you, Leslie. Yes, uh, so uh, can I get my presentation up? Thank you, Nicola. So, uh, to do, start my presentation, I'll speak a little bit of what UCLG has been doing in the last uh, few months, which is next slide. Um, we are, where we just come from having the UCLG World Congress, 
This is a Congress that happens once every three years where we renew our presidency and where we discuss and adopt um, those uh, decisions, those policies that will uh, lead uh, our next year's policy efforts. This year, we adopted Pact for the Future. This is our contribution to our common agenda from the UN and to the Summit for the Future that will happen in 2024. This Pact for the Future is structured in three uh, pillars, people, planet, and government. And it looks towards uh, redefining the, the relationship local governments have with both uh, national governments and uh, their population in a forward-thinking role. Uh, next slide, please. And this Pact for the Future has been fed uh, specifically, I'm talking in the, in the Planet pillar by our culture committee, which is uh, part of our town hall process, which is an organized discussion with civil society through the culture and climate uh, committee and has been um, cross fed by consultations from the youth caucus, the feminist caucus, and the accessibility caucus to ensure that climate and culture feed into the pact for the future in, in a horizontal and transversal way. It has been fed also from the research that has been carried out by a research team and has been published in Gold 6, our latest uh, latest report on research on local governments, which is called Pathways to Urban and Territorial Inequality, and through UCLG Meets, which is our platform or open platform for discussion uh, with local governments and civil society uh, on, on, every, on each one of our processes. Of course, we have our expert pen holders, which who have drafted the, the first uh, draft for the for the future. But it's through all these open processes that we had adopted a very forward-thinking uh, pact that will guide our love for planet, people, and government actions. Next slide, please. Uh, but currently, on the on the planet file, what we are doing at UCLG is working with climate change, with water food resilience and interbase solutions on advocating uh, at the global scale the role of local and regional governments. Of course, we're supporting the Race to Zero and Race to Resilience campaign very closely, and we're working with ECLE through the Global Task Force of Local and Regional Governments uh, into advocating at, the, at, at this global scale. We're also working very closely with the global government mayors in promoting uh, global regional of climate change policies, and we are uh, working with MCR in promoting resilience, uh, resilience house and our resilience learning module, which is linked in the in the presentation. And please share it afterwards so everyone can get the link. Um, but most of all, what we want to do is through all of these actions at the, at different scales is promoting and partly developing the planet pillar of the Back for the Future. Uh, next slide, please. As I said, we are convening uh, under the Global Task Force of Local and Regional Governments. This, as Tanya has said before, is the tool we have into advocating at the global scale uh, the role of local and regional governments and their importance in implementing the 2030 Agenda, and not only in implementing, but setting uh, forward and future thinking realistic goals, um, and specifically in the UNFCCC process, we uh, convene under the leadership of ICLE in the cities and regions in the UNFCCC process, uh, pavilion this year at the multi-level governance pavilion that will happen in COP. Uh, next slide, please. So concretely, as we know, this year's COP will have a blue zone and uh, a green zone. In the blue zone, we completed multi-level governance pavilion, as I said. Uh, led by ICLE, where we, where we as UCLG will host a high-level event at the Multilevel Action Pavilion on the 17th of November from 1.30 to 3 o'clock in the evening, no, in the afternoon. Uh, and this session will look towards uh, deepening this planet axis of the back to the future and aligning it with the goals of the Paris Agreement and how can we streamline both of these commitments uh, better, more streamlined, and, and, and localize them. Uh, we will also be part of the first ministerial on urbanization and climate change, also the 17th of November, uh, and we will host uh, 
an event from CMR, our European section on 16th of November, and from UCLG Africa, our African section on the 16th of November as well. The GTF, the Global Task Force for, the Global Task Force for Local and Regional Governments, will also hold a series of events um, in a, uh, in, for, from each one of its members, but always through the, the task force as, as, a, as an umbrella to push forward and organize a united front. Uh, we will have a climate change, C40, and the Mayor's Migration Council as well on, on the 9th and the 12th, which was four on the 13th, uh, a series of, of events from the Global Government of Mayors on the 16th and 17th, and uh, an, uh, an event on the Multilateral Action Pavilion on the 18th. We are also considering having a pavilion for the UCLG African section, and this is under discussion. But it would be interesting to have a specific um, place for our African point of view, considering this is the first time we returned to Africa since 2016 in ECO. So, this is very quickly and concretely what UCLG is planning towards go. So, next and final slide. Thank you very much. And please, if you have any, any queries or, or questions, to write to policy at uclg.org. Thank you very much, Pablo, for a very informative presentation indeed. And thank you for showing us all the platform that you are using to bring this global perspective of addressing climate change and helping cities and mayors to address them locally. Uh, so next, we will go for a uh, presentation with uh, Dana. Uh, who will let us know what are uh, the actions and the agenda uh, for Resilient Cities Network. Thank you, Nadine. Um, if I can just get the presentation and get started. So, hello, everyone. It's, it's wonderful to be joining you from New York and to be sharing uh, uh, what we as the Resilient Cities Network are looking forward to as we uh, get into the final countdown to COP27 in Shad Mashir. Uh, next slide, please. So, I think as Dania and, and Pablo both articulated, uh, but it bears emphasizing once more that, you know, I think there's a very clear opportunity um, that we see, and I think all of us that work with city governments see, um, to really amplify the role of cities as both engines of climate action, but also to highlight how vulnerable uh, cities are to the impacts of climate change. And so I think we're all going in with a very similar spirit um, to make sure that this city voice is clearly and loudly heard at, at COP27 um, and that cities uh, have a role, that they have a seat at the table, uh, that they are uh, at a, that they have the ability to advocate for themselves and for, for their residents. Um, next slide, please. So, as we go into COP uh, next week, we're, we're really starting to think about how, first of all, we can showcase the innovative and scalable resilient solutions that are already being implemented, implemented by cities to address the climate crisis. Um, as, as Pablo and Daniel have also already mentioned, you know, this is the implementation COP. This is the COP where we need to be showing progress towards the goals. We need to be showing what has been done. Uh, and so we are really going in with this mindset as a Resilient Cities Network to really showcase uh, the, the great implementation work that's being done uh, from cities across our network. In addition, we're really focused this year on talking in bringing forward this financing conversation, um, because as we talk about implementation and as we talk about what the future needs of cities will be, we also need to talk about how we pay for that and how we support cities in accessing the financing that they need uh, to implement these critical climate solutions. Next, please. So, as we go in, we're, we're really, we'll be at COP27 highlighting some of our critical key programs uh, and solutions that have emerged from our cities. So, we'll be, we'll be there talking about projects and solutions uh, in the energy resilience space, the food system and circularity space, waste circularity, water, urban water resilience, um, and increasing e equity uh, across the board. Um, I won't go into our specific sessions. Uh, we'll, I'll share a link later, which uh, you'll be able to access sort of our agenda and our calendar for COP. Uh, 
But that's to say that as a, as a network, we really believe that in showcasing uh, the incredible work that our member cities are doing um, to advance uh, solutions in each of these areas. Um, so please look out for our events, especially um, this year, we'll be doing a lot of events around circularity and food systems, which is a new space for us. Um, and is a place that we are really trying to advocate for more attention and more resources from the global community uh, to go towards uh, helping to um, improve the circularity of waste management systems in, in cities and to help promote, promote more uh, resilient food systems. Um, next uh, slide, please, thanks. And in addition, we'll be really focused this year on talking about financing and understanding and, and articulating what cities need in order to finance these, these solutions and these projects that they are undertaking. Um, so as the Resilient Cities Network, our work right now is focused on two main areas. First of all, we're working to develop financing mechanisms uh, within the Resilient Community Impact Fund, which is our new fund that leverages funding from local and global institutions for projects that deliver holistic resilience. Embedded within this Resilient Community Impact Fund are uh, many different sub funds, including hopefully a fund uh, around the that will support coastal cities and will create a coastal cities investment protocol, as well as an African cities water adaptation fund. Um, the reason that we as a network are really focused on promoting um, this fund and to really, we're really excited to go to COP and talk about it and meet with partners and funders uh, and cities about this is that as, as we've been doing this work for the last decade, um, we have, we really know that there is a critical uh, funding gap uh, in the early stage project preparation funding. And so we're, what we're trying to do through this fund and through these various sub funds is really bridge that early stage project preparation gap, that early uh investment gap that exists and that cities have a very hard time accessing financing for um in addition to talking about this fund we and these various sub funds will also be exploring how we can provide better technical assistance to cities uh to again improve uh their ability to access finance and exploring um a new area for us around risk and resilience uh insurance and resilience etc and so if you can move to the next slide, please. The, the final point I'd like to make in terms of our, our, our approach to COP this year is at the end of the day, this is a African COP. As, Pop, as Pablo says, the COP has not been in Africa since 2016. It's been a while. Um, and it's really important that we focus our work and our energy and our platforms to helping uh, highlight the vulnerability of urban dwellers in cities and across Africa and across the global south in general. And as the global conversations happen around, uh, you know, uh, the future of climate mitigation and climate adaptation, we as a Resilient Cities Network are really focused on ensuring that in every solution we help design and every climate adaptation project that we help finance, we are trying to put equity and just transition at the center. Uh, African cities are uh, amongst the most vulnerable cities in the world to climate change. Uh, they, they, two thirds of African cities are exposed to extreme climate shock, shock events. And yet uh, uh, there, these events are even more exacerbated by the, the critical stresses that these cities face, including high unemployment uh, and economic inequality, et cetera. And so, we're, our role and our hope and our you know, fervent hope for COP27 is that we have some real conversations as a global community about how to ensure that uh, these cities are not left behind and that these cities really have an opportunity to, to participate in a just transition. And that the communities that are going to be most affected by climate change uh, are, are included in the process, that they are part of the solution building, that they are part of the co-design and that we ensure that as we move forward, we leave nobody behind. Um, so if you could just go to the next slide, please. We're very excited that as uh, we will be having speakers from across our network, including mayors uh, from across various regions, uh, chief resilience officers and members of the Resilient Cities Network team. So look out for us if you see any of these familiar faces, say hello. These are part of the Resilient Cities Network family that will be in Sharm el-Sheikh this year. And next slide, please. 
Finally, um, as we go into COP, uh, please please follow us on all of our social media uh, net, uh, social media uh, channels. We are going to be posting live updates, links to how you can participate, full calendars, full agendas. Uh, get involved, become part of the conversation. Join us as we advocate uh, for cities, as we advocate for fair financing mechanisms, and as we advocate for equity and just transition. So thank you very much for being here today and I'm looking forward to uh, the Q&A section. Thanks. Very interesting to hear what the Resilient Cities Network uh, is doing, planning to do. I think it's more interesting also for the cities to understand how do we finance all these initiatives and that risk transfer mechanism insurance aspect is also very interesting. So now let's move on to our Question and answer portion. I'm sure a lot of people also have questions, but I'd like to ask um, our panelists if you were to pick top two or three messages of your respective organizations that you will bring to COP27, what would it be? Can we ask Dania? <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. Well, um, from an ICLE Africa perspective, I think it's going to be really exciting to bring our um, city authorities and representatives to the COP and to listen to what they have to say. In terms of outcomes, we're expecting that there will be a lot of messaging around financing, as Dana already highlighted, and how cities can better access climate finance at the local level and earmark and ring fence funding for their climate activities. So I think that's going to come out strongly. Messages around scaling and repli replicability that other cities can take note of and learn from. Um, so from a city's race to resilience perspective, what I'm really excited for is to hear the, the real life case studies of how cities that are signatories to the race to resilience are moving from planning to implementation and showcasing their examples of climate action plans, the challenges that they face in implementing those and integrating them across urban planning um, and how that's overcome through different means like multi-level governance or innovative financing mechanisms, et cetera. So, um, yeah, again, that's that reiteration on, on climate financing at the local level, I think is going to come out quite strongly from a city's race to resilience perspective. I take that for yes. <laughs> So uh, I think uh, our constituency of local and regional governments will continue to push uh, for the inclusion of LRGs into the localization of nationally, nationally determined contributions, as well as to continue to advocate for the localization of climate finance, capacity building of all types, and particularly for intermediary cities, small island states, uh, and developing and cities from developing states. Um, and I really want to um, put emphasis on cities of all sizes and specifically intermediary cities as our work as UCLG with them has proven um, to be a bit groundbreaking and forward thinking in putting intermediary cities as this forward thinking or forward looking a space to test uh, policies and, and, and to really rethink the, the relationships cities have with their environment in what we call and we, we all call as a constituency the rural urban continuum and the way um, intermediary cities are protectors of, of, of this uh, sort of degrade between city and, 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 and rural and really elevating the profile of these types of cities and, and putting them forward uh, as, as the new or the next climate champions is something I would really like to see. So, I mean, from my point of view, Leslie, I think one of the things that's really interesting this year is that there is no Cities Day at COP27. So, one of the things that's really interesting is there was a Cities Day last year. This year, there isn't. So, where is the city work this year? It's being distributed across the week on energy and water day and gender day, et cetera. But the real bulk of the city work is happening on Solutions Day, the last day of the conference on November 17th. 
And that's why for us, as we're going in and we've been thinking about what is our what does our work look like this year at COP27, we're really focusing on this idea as that cities solve, cities deliver, cities are centers for the solution. And I think as Daniel rightly said, the important thing and the thing that's, that we all need to be thinking about is the scalability of these solutions. Um, because it's not enough for just one-off solutions anymore. We need scalable solutions. We need replicable solutions. But in order to do that, and this is an associated piece, and this is part of the, the key messaging, is that as there's a lot of pressure to show progress, there's also going to be a lot of pressure for us, all of us that work with cities, to think about how we're tracking that progress, what the, how we're using data to show those the effectiveness of these solutions, the scalability of these solutions. And so I think that's something that we're really interested to have conversations about at COP. Um, and then the second piece is again, I just I need we need it bears putting a finer point on the financing conversation that only 10% of financing reaches local level. Um, we, and so we really need to interrogate that because if cities are really these innovation hubs, if cities are showing time and again that they're able to act quickly, act nimbly, and 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 deliver on climate action, why is it that we're only only 10% of capital flows are getting to cities? And so uh, we're hoping that we can be there together with our cities to advocate for for to the finance community, to the funder and partners community, to really rethink that. Um, rethink those numbers and, and, and really dedicate some resources towards cities and city action. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel, Pablo, and Dani. I think that these are really great messages that we need to bring to voice uh, cities as COP. And uh, going, Daniel, back to uh, Race to Resilience, we have a question coming from participants. They're asking, uh, what are the roles or how do you engage with the civil society in the Race to Resilience campaign? If you can please address that. Um, well, so the Cities Race to Resilience campaign is um, focused on cities, and in, in that sense, I work directly with cities themselves, so I'm not working with civil society per se. However, a lot of the work that we do is th by engagement with um, civil society, and in fact, one of the thematic areas that cities commit to when they join the race to resilience is community engagement. And under, under that um, pillar, cities are able to specify exactly what they're able to, to, um, to do in terms of bringing the voices of the underprivileged or marginalized or most vulnerable to the fore. So, for example, some of the um, commitments that cities can make include um, establishing new and inclusive approaches to governance that embrace a balance between economic and well-being values, co-designing the vision and choices for um, climate strategies. Um, there's um, even a, a very specific commitment where cities can commit to designating a city official or advisor to coordinate and undertake resilience projects and to engage with urban stakeholders. For example, a chief resilience officer, or I know in some of the cities that we work in, they've actually got a, a technical help desk in different departments um, in, the, in the relevant um, city departments that are engaging directly with communities. So I don't know if that answers your question from a city's race to resilience perspective. Nice, uh, quick and short answer. Uh, I'm sure everyone will be looking forward to, to hearing more about this race to resilience uh, progress uh, towards COP. Another interesting topic, aside from bringing in the communities, how can the communities be involved in the work that the cities are doing is, what is the clear role of the cities in terms of the development and execution of our climate agenda? And how can we ensure that they are well represented during COP27? Uh, Dana mentioned that it's baffling why you don't find a session that's dedicated for cities this time around. So what do you think is the role of the cities in terms of development and execution of this climate agenda? Um, maybe Dana and or Pablo. Go ahead, Pablo. <laughs> okay. 
So if I understood correctly, we were talking a little bit about the, the, the role of cities implementing this climate agenda, and of course, uh, the importance uh, they are given or not given at its year scope. Uh, as, as we said, and we repeat it time and again, of course, we don't have a dedicated um, a dedicated city there, and it's a shame, given that the previous year we did. But I think that we, we are seeing the, through the presidency of the COP this year, a change of narrative, of course, we do realize this is uh, an African COP, and this will put a lot more pressure in, in talking about adaptation and even loss and damage that this has been discussed by by the the, the presidency to as a topic to, to to put on the table and I, I believe these are the places where um at the moment as a local regional government constituency we really should be um you know putting our attention and, and fighting our battles we are we at the moment we're going to get um more exposition than we have at COP and The agenda is very spread out, and our, and our efforts are very thin. And this is something that I have said, and it's something we're facing. We we are not getting um, we are getting the, the the starlight moment that we used to have. So that's why um, I'm bringing the, the the global task force for for local regional governments again to use this this platform to use this 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 method uh, of of coordinating and 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 making united and coordinated efforts. To, to showcase all throughout the two weeks of the COP, which are many days, uh, places to, to include mayors. We from the UCLG uh, are going to be bringing uh, uh, quite, quite a number, and hopefully um, with our partners we'll be able to showcase them. As cities and in relation to, to, to this year's agenda, uh, I hope we can stop uh, discussing cities as implementers uh, because we're not just motors of, of implementation, but rather uh, as as levels of government, elected levels of governments that can set their own agenda. So, so this is uh, yeah, maybe more than I should have said, but this is uh, what I'm thinking. Leslie, I don't know if we, you find this the answer sufficiently answered or if you want me to add my two cents here. <laughs> but I'm in, but all good. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I was just going to say, I think um, I, it's it's wonderful, again, that I think that partners, our partners like UCLG and like ICWI are um, doing all, have been doing the really good work to bring a lot of cities and make sure that cities are physically represented that through their mayors who and through their chief resilience officers and other chief sustainability officers etc and i think that that's that's a really that's a start is making sure that we have the the, the cities that can there who can speak for themselves i think the other piece though is we need to be as as networks as city networks um as advocates, as as partners, we should all be prepared to be there to, with with the, with the stories, with with the with the with the case studies, with the with the actual details. Because it's I think it's not enough anymore to talk about sort of these high, you know, stay at this thirty thousand foot level, but to actually show how cities are are designing, how they're implementing, how they're changing the the course of their you know their future. Um, and I think that. It, you know, we should we should be there and we should be deliberate about sharing those stories uh, in these various forums so that people understand this incredible amount, uh, the breadth and the depth of the work that's happening uh, at the city level. Thank you, Dana. And uh, yes, Nadine. Um, yes, oh, sorry, Nadine. Yeah, no, please go ahead. Um, I just wanted to to add that um, you know it, last year there might have been a specific cities day, Dana, as you mentioned, but uh, the problem with last year was that there were so many restrictions related to COVID that I know, for example, a lot of our African mayors couldn't couldn't actually attend COP. So, um, you know, I think uh, you, this year we've got Human Settlements Day, which is on the 17th of November and covers cities. So there is going to be a lot of focus on cities on the 17th of November. But what we 
do at ICLEI is try and integrate cities across every single day, um, as you mentioned. And through the LGMA constituency, there's going to be more than 70 sessions that focus on subnational governments um, at COP, and that will be hosted in the LGMA Action Pavilion itself. And then on top of that, we've got the Urban Africa in Action program, which has sessions on every single day focus specifically um, on different topics across um, uh, different sectors, whether it's energy, finance, resilience building, nature-based solutions, but very much focused on Africa itself and African cities and what their local context is and what their challenges are. Um, so I just wanted to, to flag that, that cities are really um, maybe still underrepresented, but they are starting to take a lead and being integrated across the different themes of, of COP27. Yeah, thank you, Dania. Yeah, indeed, we can we can feel that yeah, cities are not very much prioritized to lead the discussions uh, sometimes. And that brings another question that I am taking from the participants as well, who are asking about how do we build a resilience community in Africa? So if we're, if we're feeling that cities are being underrepresented, but what about uh, cities in Africa? How do we make sure by going to COP? Um, how are we benefiting really the African cities and the whole idea of COP being in Egypt with a lens on Africa? Um, so just your thoughts, your impression uh, on this statement. How do you think that we can build the resilience of African cities through our participation in, in COP or in general? Um, we can do uh, respectively from, yeah, Dani, if you want, you can start if you, and Pablo and then Dana. Sure, thanks Nadine. Um, it's a, a great question. It's the question of our time. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, the point is that often our, our African cities are um, under-resourced and under-capacitated, whether that's related to human or our financial resources, um, it is a problem that we we do face. Um, but there are lots of new and different ways that we are engaging with cities. So, uh, um, as I mentioned before, one of the aspects that um, is a focus of the work that we do at ICLEI is on multi-level governance. So ensuring that there's a vertical and horizontal integration and collaboration between government tiers, whatever those um, functions are. So uh, this is done to ensure that, um, as Pablo mentioned, um, cities are not just seen as implementation agents of national government, but they're actually involved in planning um, vertically and they understand their nationally determined contributions and they can also work closely with national um, government to flag what the local context is and what is is possible in terms of action. Um, so the, the other aspect is, um, of course, when it comes to financing, de-risking cities and how do we do that? I think um, that is a complex question. Um, maybe can't be unpacked in, in a two minute response, but I think there is um, technical support that our um, that partners like ICLEI, UCLG, RCN can provide cities in terms of um, supporting them, providing technical guidance, um, creating participatory processes, whether that's engaging with civil society, um, academia and research, or national governments or the private sector, there are ways that we can um, facilitate change and, and enable city level to um, de-risk themselves and to start um, being very proactive and in integrating resilience across urban planning. Um, another thing I want to flag is data. Data is incredibly important when we're talking about climate change. Um, a city a city can develop a climate action plan only once they've got an evidence-based risk and vulnerability assessment um, in place. When they understand what the actual risks to the city are, then they can take that forward and start developing a climate action plan that integrates resilience and adaptation across their urban um, decision-making and, and planning. 
so I think data is something that is is critical to to work on going forward. Thank you, Dania. I think uh, before we close this uh, panel, I'd like to ask a very interesting question. Uh, they say we go in uh, with an end in mind, right? Uh, so lead up to COP twenty seven. What are what do you think are the important next steps after COP twenty seven? Knowing that there are these challenges, uh, having an interest in cities, uh, getting their voices heard. What do you think are the important next steps after COP? Wants to take a shot. We have room for one answer, and then I think uh, the dean will try to close the session. Uh, I, uh, uh, no, 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 let's go. But I think, uh, I think, uh, yeah, we have one, round. one but we'll just spoil the book. Uh, no, I think, um, for me, the, the, the next steps, and this is linked to, to the previous question a little bit, is, is uh, strengthening our efforts in peer learning for cities of all sizes. Taking a little bit what Daniel was saying about capacity building, of course, this is something that after the craziness of, of COVID, something that, that will put a lot of our resources in, uh, really developing capacities on, on better resilience um, governance for cities of all sizes. We, at the moment, have a resilience model in, in our UCLG learning platform, which I will copy now in the, in the chat so you can access and you can see uh, what are the, the, the ways in which we train uh, city, city government officials into into working better with their cities but also of course strengthening our work with with the, all of, uh, of of the constituency of all of the networks into really uh producing a unified uh and joint work in the in the territories this is something i would like to, to see happening in, in the in the near short future so i think again related to the earlier question as well uh, I think there's, there's one of the things that we really need to focus on is we really need to focus on partnerships. And this is part of going back to what Daniel was saying. You know, cities are under resourced, especially in Africa, especially in the global south. And it doesn't help when we are so many different organizations, so many different institutions going in with our very, you know, a variety of agendas and, and priorities. And so I think we need to do better. We must do better. Um, to partner together so that we're not overwhelming these under-resourced cities and that we're working together to actually achieve the change that I think we all believe is, is critical. Um, and so I'm really hoping that we come out of this COP with some very strong partnerships that we all, uh, we can, you know, really link arms and start to do this difficult work together uh, with our cities. I think there is a tremendous amount of uh, planning fatigue at the city level. I think cities are really, they, they're looking for action. They're looking for partners who will work together to help them implement, who will help them execute, who will help them, uh, you know, do all these things that they've been thinking about and planning uh, for. And so uh, I'm looking forward to this being a really action oriented COP and for us to come out with stronger partnerships and stronger action plans um, as we move forward. And so that, Hopefully next year when we all get together in Abu Dhabi, um, we have even more success stories to share, even more lessons uh, from cities to share and even more data uh, to learn from. So uh, that's it from me. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share and uh, looking forward to seeing you all in Sharm Sheikh. Dana and Daniel, would you like to add anything in one minute uh, or very good? <laughs> Please feel free to add in. Okay, great then. Well, uh, then I would like to thank you all for a very interesting panel for a resourceful presentation. It was really great to listen from all of you about the plans that you're bringing to COP. They're very inspiring and I'm very sure that our participants have, have learned a lot. And they, I'm sure you will meet some of them in Charm and uh, you, will, you will continue this conversation, which we hope uh, uh, will, will happen. Uh, so from Resilient Cities uh, Network side and the World Bank, uh, we would like to thank everyone for joining. And I would like to remind you that the Cities on the Frontline series is a bi-weekly session. So uh, on November the 24th, we will be with another uh, session on equity and climate risk. So please 
stay tuned, register, and please always attend and participate and let us know what are your dreams to make our world more resilient. Thank you again, Dania. Thank you again, Paolo. Thank you again, Dana. Hope to see you in Sharm and hope to see you in uh, other conversations. Have a good day and stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.